Welcome to the Proceedings Podcast. I'm Bill Hamlet, the Editor-in-Chief of Proceedings at the U.S. Naval Institute. Today is Tuesday, May 16th, 2023. Good to have you on board, everybody. Uh, today's show is brought to you by the members of the Naval Institute since 1873, 150 years. The members of the Naval Institute have been the foundation of everything we do, from proceedings to naval history to USNI news to professional books, and conferences and events. If you enjoy the show, ring the bell, subscribe, recommend us to your friends, and become a member of the Naval Institute at usni.org forward slash join. In news from Annapolis, last Wednesday we had our annual meeting, our 150th annual meeting. If you missed it, you can check it out at usni.org forward slash events. Our essay contest winners, our authors of the year, our State of the Institute by Vice Admiral Pete Daly, our CEO. We had a presentation by historian Craig Simons on 150 years of Naval Institute and US Navy and Sea Service history and how they intertwined and interacted. And then I got to host a wonderful panel discussion with three of our best active duty authors, Commander Craig Allen, US Coast Guard, Lieutenant Andrea Howard, US Navy, and Captain LJ Winnefeld, US Marine Corps. Again, if you missed it, go back and check it out on our events site. It was, uh, it was quite an annual uh, meeting and just uh, great, great comments from those essay contests and prize winners and, and also just the update on the state of the Naval Institute from our CEO. Um, now we're in that period of the year where uh, things get exciting at the Naval Academy uh, on the yard. It's graduation week next week at the Academy. Congrats to the class of 2023. Uh, the plebes will climb Herndon Monument tomorrow. That's always fun to watch. The Blue Angels will be here next Tuesday for their practice next Wednesday. And graduation is a week from Friday. Always a fun week to be on and around the yard. Uh, we are blessed uh, at, to be working at the Naval Institute and to, be, uh, to have our headquarters there in Annapolis and on the Academy Yard. Okay, uh, so let's get to our guest. Joining me from his home in Switzerland today is my friend and colleague, retired Navy Captain Jim Fennell. Jim is a career Naval Intelligence Officer who spent much of his career in the Indo-Pacific, including tours at the Joint Intelligence Center in Hawaii, Carrier Air Wing Intelligence Officer, USS Kitty Hawk Carrier Strike Group N2. He was the Director of Intelligence for the Seventh Fleet and the Pacific Fleet. And as I mentioned when he was on the show last August, Jim was one of the first people in the US Navy to warn about the rapid buildup of Chinese naval power and to call out China's illegal and irresponsible behavior at sea starting more than 15 years ago. Jim, it's great to have you back on the show. Bill, uh, it's really an honor to be able to uh, talk to you and your audience again. It's great to catch up. Thanks for the invite. Yeah, and, and thanks again. This is the third year in a row. So in the May issue of Proceedings, you've done another update, an outstanding update for us on the state of the PLA Navy. Uh, it's called Growing and Going to Sea this year. So more growth in the PLA Navy that, that continues at a rapid pace. Uh, and you've got some slides as you did last year for us. You got some slides and a presentation. So you're like the best guest we have because I sort of turn it over to you. You give a presentation, we'll do some Q&A at the end. So, so take it away, Jim. Sure, thanks. Well, I'll start off with the first slide here, uh, a little bit different than last year. Uh, right after uh, we had our conversation, uh, Chinese Global Times came up with this little uh, picture on the uh, left side of the screen. Uh, China, not even a bit can be left behind. And what you see is the outline of the, the, the shape of China in gold. And then you see uh, all these little gold dots, which are the islands and the, the atolls and things that they believe are theirs. And the nine dash line, the nine uh, lines are now 10 lines. You'll see there's a 10th one on the east side of Taiwan. And it, essentially, it's, a, it's kind of a real statement in the, in the wake of uh, the speaker's uh, visit and the big exercise that they had in August of that year. So um, it just kind of gives you a, a sense of the, the totality of uh, China's approach to things, which is their belief and their, their strategic goal of this great rejuvenation, which uh, Xi you know, kind of rolled out publicly in 2013. It's a continuation of the previous PLA leaders, uh, but Xi's broke with the, uh, the hide and bide strategy that uh, Deng brought in, and he feels confident enough to be able to do that. And so they're working on that. 
And key to that uh, great rejuvenation is, uh, you know, maritime power. And Xi has been really the first paramount leader in uh, the People's Republic of China's history that's really put so much energy and effort into uh, the maritime theater, the, the theater that everybody here on th this podcast is familiar with the United States and the United States Navy. And so one way to measure how uh, a nation's committed to those kind of things that they say that they're interested in is to see what they actually spend their money on. And you can see here just a little snapshot uh, for the last uh, four years, 2018 to 2022, that China's uh, uh, PLA growth in their defense budget grew, has grown every year, 8% through in this uh, 2022 is 7.1%. Uh, and then you'll see up in the top right corner um, for 2023 that uh, the growth of the PLA was by announced in this, uh, what they call the two sessions of the National People's Congress in March. They said they'd grow it by 7.2%. And that's despite the, their overall GDP growth of the PRC being at 5%. So once again, a continuation of every year, the PLA growth in spending, uh, they get more dollars or RMB uh, than, they, than the rest of the country in terms of the growth of the budget. And that's been continuous for many, many years. Uh, and you'll see that right now it's estimated that for 2023, China will spend about a quarter of a trillion dollars on, uh, on its defense department. And when we know that they don't claim everything like research and development, and they don't take into account purchasing power parity. So that number is much larger. And we'll see it reflected in things like this, which talk about, you know, how many platforms the PRC is putting out each year uh, and the cumulative total. And you can see here in this graphic that over the last uh, 22 years, China really starting around 2010, really started to take off in the number of platforms, of battle force uh, platforms that they built. Uh, and then this year in 2022, you'll see that they produced 10 platforms, uh, one uh, Type 75 uh, LHA, three Type 055 Bren High Class Cruisers, four uh, Luyang 3 destroyers, one frigate, and then one Yuan SSP. 10 platforms, about 110,000 tons, which is a little bit less than they had last year when they commissioned 22 platforms. Uh, but again, it's still, even though it was smaller than 2022, it was still greater than anybody else uh, in the region and around the world. So China is the number one producer of warships and submarines uh, on the planet and has been so for over five years or up to five years. I'd say we could challenge that a little bit more if we went out. But the point is made, China is putting out uh, a large number of warships. And these are capable warships that uh, enable China to achieve their, their, their goals and their dreams. I would point out that the 110,000 uh, tons is a roughly about one third of the entire size of the French Navy, if you wanted a reference point, that in one year, China produced the size of the, the third, uh, one third of the size of the French Navy. And that's why you have people like Tom Sugar at the CNAS that are continuing to estimate that the Chinese PLA Navy growth is going to continue to grow. And I think that's a good estimate. And you can see that reflected in this blue line uh, on the graphic as we head out from 2023 into the out years. It continues to look like that's the priorities that the PRC and the Chinese Communist Party have for their budget. And we've seen that reflected in platforms like this, like their third aircraft carrier, the Fujian, which we talked about last time that was launched last June. And here they are by April of this year, already out and about uh, doing uh, power and mooring drills. And we would expect to see them out doing sea trials here, uh, you know, in, in the next couple of months, if not, you know, who knows, maybe they're doing it right now, probably not right now. But the, the estimate is, is that sometime this summer or in the fall, they're going to be out doing their sea trials and, and most likely they'll get a, you know, a commissioning here uh, in, in this year, which would give them th three, uh, fully uh, capable uh, carriers, at least in terms of commissioning uh, the, the Shandong and Liaoning, Liaoning and Shandong, the first two uh, are assessed to be uh, operationally capable for the PLA at this point. And this graphic here, this is from the, the, the Chinese um, Global Times, but I think it just kind of puts into perspective there the three carriers that China has. And it's worth remembering that uh, the Fujian was launched in June, 17th, 2022, but that's basically 10 years 
after the Liao Ning, their first one went to sea. So in the space of 10 years, they went from not having any aircraft carriers to having three. And, and you know, the, there's still estimates that the fourth uh, platform is, you know, being constructed or at least elements of it or the modules of it are being put together uh, in Zhangnangdao, which would, in, which is near Shanghai, which would, again, maybe in 2024, we would start to see something more tangible about the uh, fourth carrier. Hey, Jim, just a question, if I could, on the Fujian. Sure. Uh, if I remember right, that's 80,000 ton, roughly. So a little smaller than, uh, than you know, U.S. Nimitz class carriers. But this one's in, indigenously designed, engineered, produced, uh, and it's got electromagnetic catapults. And it's not a ski jump ramp like the other two are that were uh, foreign design, right? That were Ukrainian or Russian Soviet design. Yep, you hit them all. That's exactly right. This is a big deck carrier. It's on the order of the size of an, one of the first uh, Nimitz class carriers, 80,000 tons. Uh, and, and it's really, you know, we don't know how those uh, EMALs or electromagnetic aircraft launch systems will work, but the fact that they installed them uh, and, and that they're, you know, I think they know that they're going to work or they're going to go through the process of making them work because they, they wouldn't want to have a system out there that's going to fail. Uh, they're very uh, risk adverse, I think, in, in that sense that they bring things after they've already tested them in other areas and other uh, settings. And so I think we're going to start to see something that's going to be very interesting, which gets to their carrier operations, which I think you can characterize since the end of uh, December of 2021 through right now, uh, we're starting to really see the Chinese Navy go to sea in the same way uh, that the U.S. Navy carrier strike groups and expeditionary strike groups have Got long gone to sea. And the Chinese really started, I think you can call 2022 as the year where they really go to sea with their carrier force. And uh, here's just a couple of uh, uh, a graphic or two that shows some of the deployments that they made in uh, 2022 or December 21 and then May of 2022 uh, with Liao Ning. Uh, there's some great stuff that uh, Mike Dom put out in your January uh, issue, which I highly recommend everybody read. It's really Mike's gone into excruciating analysis and talks about all the facets of what we know, at least in the unclassified arena, about these carrier operations. But I think it's worth noting that they're operating in the blue water, just like our carriers did, uh, just like, you know, when I was on the Kitty Hawk coming out of Tokyo, uh, Wan, and we would go down and operate east of Okinawa in, in much in the same way uh, that the uh, Chinese have done this last year. Now, it's not the same as us. And terms of flight uh, numbers of platforms that they're putting up, numbers of sorties. Uh, but it's, a, again, as you mentioned, they're ski jump platforms, so they're not going to be able to put that many sorties up. But the idea is that they've presented a new threat vector to Taiwan that I don't think most people 10 years ago would have actually thought could have actually materialized this fast. Uh, and then we had this year, this is from December of 22, and you can see uh, this time uh, the, the carrier again going out and operating well to the east of, uh, of, of Taiwan and actually real close to Guam. And so this is the, uh, um, uh, the Liaoning again. Uh, she was out operating, you can see close uh, up north towards uh, Honshu and then down towards Guam. Uh, but these are really sustained blue water operations. They're not, they're not out there for multiple weeks, but they're out there for a couple of weeks. They're flying, they're operating, uh, and uh, they're learning. And I think this is really the, the key. And, and for their own kind of self-protection, they're operating under a strategic rocket force kind of umbrella. So they know that wherever they're operating inside the second island chain, that they're going to have kind of their own uh, you know, strategic rocket force backing them up and making sure that in addition to whatever they could put out from the strike group, whether it's from a, you know, an anti-ship cruise missile from the Ren High class cruiser, or it's an, whatever the carrier aircraft could launch, they know that they're going to get uh, DF-21Ds and DF-26s, and then you know, air-launched air, aircraft uh, providing air-launch missiles as well. Here's just one picture, just to pick, uh, showing the Liao Ning uh, out as she was in the Western Pacific there operating uh, last December. You can see one of the J-15s launching off the ski ramp, and on the in the in the 
background, you'll see that's a Japanese uh, a platform that's out there as they're shadowing and watching. And so I was really happy to see that. It's a, it's a good reminder to us that that we're operating out there as well. And so we're, there's things that we're learning. We may not get to read about it in the newspaper uh, or in the proceedings per se, uh, but it's good to know that our, our seventh fleet is out there uh, watching. In addition to the aircraft carriers, the Chinese have uh, done a remarkable job when it comes to uh, their amphibious uh, vessels. And so what you see here is uh, the third type 075 uh, that was uh, uh, launched or commissioned last October. And here it is a month later and it's out doing uh, training and training evolutions just a month after it was commissioned. And uh, this is a, again, this is about a 45,000 ton platform equivalent to our San Antonio class. And they have produced three of those basically in the last 18 months. So they've commissioned one, uh, one, one about every six months. So it's pretty remarkable how, how quickly they're putting these big decks out into the water again, uh, to be, uh, coordinating and operating together at sea with, you know, cruisers and destroyers as part of their emerging expeditionary strike group. Here's a, a picture of two of the, the first two uh, Type 075s, amphibious assault ships. Uh, the Hainan and the Guangxi are out operating, doing training together uh, earlier this, or in 2022, late 2022. And then when I put a little bullet down there, or highlight box at the bottom, you know, in the last three years, since 2020 to 2023, the Chinese uh, produced three of these uh, LHAs, 075s, and two Type 071 LPDs, and those are 25,000 tons. So they put they put in a lot of uh, uh, iron in the water for the amphibious side of the house. And in the same space of time, we've only produced one uh, San Antonio class uh, platform, the Fort Lauderdale, and we lost the, the Bonhomme Richard. So we're kind of broke even in three years and they put up five, five platforms. So that kind of, for me, is kind of emblematic of the disparity that we've had over the last decade in terms of ship production and where we're at, and that's not a good trend line. Jim, I think you said a minute ago that the Type 075 was equivalent to uh, San Antonio, but I, I think you meant a WASP class or America class, whereas the, uh, the, the other one, the smaller one, is equivalent to the LPD, RLPD, correct? Yeah, that's right. Yep, sorry, my mistake. Um, here you have the eighth uh, of the type 075 or the type 055 Ren High class cruiser. This is the eighth one, and it was just commissioned here uh, this this year. Uh, it's uh, it, it, you know putting eight of these in the in in the water in the space of uh, less than a decade is pretty impressive. These are these are arguably one of the most impressive platforms, uh, surface platforms in the in the sea today. 112 vertical launch system missiles, land attack cruise missiles, anti-ship cruise missiles, uh, surface-to-air missiles, long-range surface-to-air missiles, and these are providing basically the shotgun uh, for the uh, for their new carrier strike groups and expeditionary strike groups, and they're also operating alone as kind of their own uh, SAG leaders, if you will. And we've seen them operate uh, around Japan. We've seen them operate up in the uh, going up towards Alaska in the, in the Bering Sea. And they've, they've been kind of their own platform as well. But, uh, you know, there's eight of them right now. I would expect, given their desires to have more carriers and more expeditionary strike groups, that we'll probably see uh, a new run of these here in the near term in the next year or two. And, and we're looking there at, Jim, uh, phased array radars, advanced, pretty sleek looking. I don't know if there's any stealth uh, built into the hull for them, but... Uh, that's that's an advanced looking ship. Also, twelve to thirteen thousand tons, if memory serves. That's correct. Twelve, thirteen thousand tons when fully loaded out, and it is uh, it is you know an advanced uh, in terms of whole form. It's it's not uh, it's not one of their older platform types, and so it's it's a very capable uh, weapon system, able to provide all uh, kind of all domain uh, protection for their big decks. I put this slide in just to remind folks that sometimes, you know, we talk about, uh, you know, our understanding of what the Chinese are doing. And this is from the Chinese, uh, Chinese website, but we got uh, two type 052 Delta uh, destroyers. Um, these are the Luyang three uh, DDGs. And we thought, I think 
the conventional wisdom was is that last year or the year before that we we wouldn't see these anymore. And they've got over 28 of them. And so now we've, we're seeing it looks like another run of the uh, of the Lu Yang uh, 3 DDG, which is to say that I think they're going to continue to expand these kind of strike group platforms that, that they need to be able to operate uh, multiple carrier strike groups and multiple expeditionary strike groups simultaneously. Uh, a couple other things that the Chinese have been doing with their Navy in terms of just kind of platforms and production, expanding their uh, naval or their submarine bases. Here is uh, Huladao up in the Bohai. And uh, on, the, on the right side of the graphic, you'll see two orange squares. Uh, those are two construction halls that over the last three or four years have been completed. And it's estimated that the new type, o, uh, type 95 and the type 96 uh, SSN and SSBN that are going to be coming into the PLA Navy submarine force will be produced in these halls. Uh, and, it, and then recently, just in this imagery right here, which I think is from uh, just in the last couple of uh, months, uh, you'll see in that yellow uh, roped off areas, it looks like they've extended the period space there at Huladao, which means they're anticipating putting more platforms in at a higher rate of production. And so they need the capacity to be able to, uh, you know, keep those submarines uh, pure side while they're, you know, producing them and getting them fitted out and getting them completed for sea trials. So just an indicator of the growth and the expansion of their of their naval production facilities. And then this is down at Yulin and on Hainan Island. And you'll see on the right, uh, there's a box at the top and a box at the bottom where you can faintly see that they're in the process of expanding from four piers to six piers. And this is where they're keeping uh, their gin class SSBNs right now, at least a, a number of them. And so this indicates again that the, in terms of nuclear submarine production at Huladal looks to be increasing and that they'll have a place to put these in the operational sense. And I would expect we'll see more uh, SSBNs operating out of, of, of this area and to be able to operate into the bastion which is why that first slide in the nine dash line and the Chinese uh, view of believing that the inside the nine dash line is, is, is their, their press quotes a lot is it's their territorial waters. And they, they know that, or they believe that, and they want to use that as a bastion for their SSBNs to operate. And why is that important? Well, just point out here in November of last year, Admiral Papro, the PAC fleet commander, uh, came out and testified, or not testified, but talked to some reporters and revealed that now uh, that he assesses that Gin class SSBNs, the six that they have, are equipped with the new JL3 SLBM. And he, you know, he stated that these are specifically built to threaten the United States of America. They basically increase uh, the range from uh, about 4,200 uh, nautical miles uh, for the JL2 to uh, 6,200 uh, or 40, it's about 4,500 miles for the JL2 and about 6,200 miles uh, for the JL3. And so if you're operating from, you know, uh, the South China Sea, or if you're operating anywhere inside the second island chain, you're going to be able to, you know, reach the United States of America, may not reach all of it, you may have to come a little bit east. But these are really serious uh, missiles. And if you add in the fact that they're, they may have up to three uh, you know, so there's various estimates on the number of MERV warheads that they'd have. But if they had three new uh, uh, warheads, uh, MERVs in those JL3s, three warheads, it's going to, you know, add to the ICBM silos that we've seen out in Western and Central China, uh, which really dramatically, as Admiral uh, Richards, the, out, the, the former STRATCOM commander said last year that, you know, China's having a strategic nuclear breakout. And this JL3 and the PLA a Navy submarine force, nuclear ballistic missile force are all part of that breakout. And then here's just the image of the silos out in Western and Central China, 350 silos built in the last uh, 24 months. Uh, very, very concerning, especially in, in, as you start to consider a move against Taiwan. And Jim, this, those, are, those are silos for ICBMs. Those are Nuclear you know, strategic strategic rocket force, nuclear ICBMs. Correct. Those are, that's the assessment from the at least the experts at the Federation of American Scientists and all that I can read. Now, there's some debate on whether they're filled or not. 
but you know, I, I tend to, I, I, I tended to uh, lean more towards when they build something that they're ready to use it. And if you go back a decade or 12 years ago, and you look at some of the studies that uh, Phil Carber did uh, when he was at Georgetown with his undergraduates and graduate students talking about the great underwall uh, of China, uh, you know, we, we, there's a lot that we don't know about what China is building in terms of their nuclear uh, arsenal and capabilities. But this is a, re a sign here, these 350 silos, and then the statements by Admiral Papro about the SSBNs and the JL3 and what we're seeing at Hula Dao and, and Yulin all lead towards this kind of really concerted effort to build up China's uh, nuclear arsenal rapidly. This slide here, uh, just put this in just to remind folks that in any invasion of Taiwan, you know, Taiwan's very vulnerable to being able to communicate with the rest of the world. As we know, uh, you know, most of our communications comes through undersea uh, cables. And so Taiwan is vulnerable to those. And what we had here in February uh, off of uh, the mainland of China, those two Taiwan islands uh, near Matsu, you had two cuts that occurred in relatively in a, in a week in the space of a week. You had two of the cables to the Matsu Island that were cut, and they were basically incommunicado for a while, uh, and had to rely on older systems. And I just remind folks that this is a capability that China has and is looking into, and we we need to be aware of that. Another kind of non-traditional area is in these roll-on roll-off ships. There's been some really good work done by the China Maritime Studies Institute. Uh, again, I mentioned Tom Sugar, the Center for New, Center for New American Studies, uh, think tank, former Navy officer, captain, uh, submarine officer. He did some analysis last August after the Pelosi visit and after the uh, major uh, missile exercise that occurred 4 to 7 August. He did some tracking of some of these roll-on, roll-off ships. There was about seven or eight of them, I believe that he tracked down to the Fujian province and they, they were doing an amphibious exercise and these roll-on roll-off platforms were involved and they were offloading uh, PLA uh, Marine Corps troops and uh, Marine Corps uh, fighting vehicles as you can see there on the bottom right. These vessels are, I, I think, uh, you know, basically they have room for cargo to go in wheeled vehicles uh, enough to basically, uh, for Tom's estimate, about 1.6 miles worth of uh, uh, vehicle space inside one of these platforms. And so, you know, we saw, he saw eight of them. Uh, who knows how many more there are? He saw them coming from one location. Uh, but uh, we have to consider that each one of these provinces that butts up along the eastern seaboard of China has something similar or has similar tasking to provide civilian roll-on, roll-off uh, platforms that would help in any kind of invasion of Taiwan, which was all fit into their doctrine of people's war. And this is just another example of a main battle tank and how it could come off a roll-on, roll-on, roll-off ship. So many times we talk about, well, we're going to have to, we don't, the, the PLA doesn't have enough lift to conduct an amphibious invasion of Taiwan. Uh, we can debate that. But what we can't debate is if the PRC and the PLA's strategy is, is to take a major Taiwan port and focus their efforts into taking one of those ports, and you can roll in with these kind of platforms, you're going to be able to roll in a lot of hardware uh, to help uh, achieve uh, an invasion uh, victory for the PLA. Uh, one slide here just to remind folks also that there's a whole lot of missile systems that the Chinese are developing. Uh, this one, the YJ-21 Strike Eagle, uh, imaged in the mainframe there, April of last year, 2022, uh, on board an H6N uh, bomber, uh, but also in the, the top left, you can see one being launched uh, from a PLA Navy surface combatant. So it's assessed now that they have this, uh, uh, basically this thing can go Mach 10. Uh, it's, a, you know, essentially a, a kind of a hypersonic type of a, a weapon system. So in addition to the, the YJ-18s and the CJ-10s and all these other supersonic uh, anti-ship cruise missiles, the Chinese are, you know, continuing to invest in and develop uh, missiles that are designed to sink our big decks now beyond the second island chain, which is why you're, you're hearing more and more talk and more analysis from think tanks that talk about 
the China's threat. You know, when you and I were still wearing a uniform, we were talking about what would China do and the PLA do inside the first island chain? What could they do? And then it was maybe what can they do inside the second island chain? And now we're, we're, we're having to honestly consider what they can do outside the, the third island chain. And that means even for folks in Hawaii have to be concerned now. Um, not just to, or to shift a little bit is to talk about not only are they designing stuff for themselves and operating themselves, uh, but the Chinese are working a lot with the Russians. And so uh, there were a lot of coordinated operations last year, and there, and there have been many years in a row uh, with the Chinese and the Russians. But just one example here is the Vostok exercise that the Russians run, which is their, kind of their strategic nuclear exercise. And what we saw here in December of 22 was Chinese and, and, and Russian warships circumnavigating uh, uh, Japan going up through the Sugaro Strait around Hokkaido. And so this is not a, a and thank, thankfully the Japanese are putting this out in the press and we can get, you know, some understanding at the unclassified level of what's going on, but this is increasingly becoming, uh, you know, happening more and more Russian and Chinese uh, operations together. And you would have expected maybe, I think some people may have expected that since Putin invaded the Ukraine, that China may, may have tried to dial that down. But my assessment is that they've actually increased their military cooperation and coordination. And one of these exercises, it's not in the Navy, but in their air forces, you had Russian bombers landing in China following a coordinated uh, training exercise in the Sea of Japan and Yellow Sea and Russian bomber or a Chinese bombers landing in, in Vlad. And so really a level of a uh, coordination that I don't think people really appreciate that you got Japanese or uh, Russian and, and Chinese fighters and bombers coordinating in the air, flying together and their navies operating together. And I think the depth of cooperation is something that, you know, is, is uh, on purpose. And I think it's a, a way for them to signal to Japan and South Korea that, uh, you know, it's not just China or Japan, it's Ch China and or China and Russia alone. It's China and Russia together. Uh, I talked about the missiles. I'll just clip through that. So let's go back to last August, the 4th through 7th August. We saw what uh, I've characterized. I think what we're seeing in August of last year, and then we'll talk about uh, the joint sword exercise this April, is I think we've seen two, two elements of the three elements of what I think are the Chinese doctrine talks about their Taiwan invasion strategy. The, the first one is this joint fire strike campaign. And so you had 11... Uh, ballistic missiles were fired uh, at Taiwan in that exercise period. You can see that they bracketed, they surrounded Taiwan. They had, for the first time ever, J-20 aircraft approaching. And then on a daily basis, they had 13, 14 PLA Navy combatants surrounding uh, uh, Taiwan, uh, operating in the strait east of the center line and also east of Taiwan proper. So that's what we saw. And uh, again, I characterize that exercise last August is the first phase, the joint fire strike campaign. Hey, Jim, that, and, was, uh, that was just after uh, Speaker Pelosi's visit to Taiwan, right? That was just uh, kicked off a few days afterwards. Correct. And I know that some people have used that visit as a, well, she shouldn't have done that. And this, this was the impetus for causing that. But as you and I know, you don't pull off a major exercise, military exercise, unless you've been working on it, planning it and coordinating it for weeks, if not months beforehand. So I think the Chinese were planning to do it. August is a big training month for them, as you know. And right. so this was something that they were going to find some some reason to have an excuse uh, to, to pull this off because they're on a timeline and we'll get to that later, but they, they need to have kind of this culmination event to be able to, uh, I think, assure Xi that they're capable of the elements, the major building blocks of, of an invasion. So they did this in August. It really shattered the, the conventional wisdom about, you know, the relationship between China and Taiwan in terms of military demarcation. So you have this Taiwan Strait, the median line. It's not an official median line, but as uh, uh, Pete Pedroso at the Navy War College uh, wrote up this last year, it was end of 
towards the end of 22, he, he did some analysis. And basically from the inception of that median line in 1954 until the uh, 2020, there had only been four incursions by uh, PLA aircraft across the center line, four in, uh, wow. in, in basically 60 years or a little over 60 years or 50 years. And this is what you see just between two and 21 August of last year. It, you know, multiple, I think there was over 40 incursions just in that space of those few days. And then this is another graphic that kind of shows a uh, compilation of the whole year, uh, but it, they break out that there was over 400, I think, uh, crossings uh, for 2022, which really just puts into perspective the dramatic increase and the changed norm of what's happening between uh, Taiwan and the PRC and how the, the, you know, the noose is just getting tighter and tighter and it's really ramped up. And Jim, a question on, question on that, if, if, if you will, uh, the, do, do the Taiwan, does the Taiwan military feel obligated to respond to every one of those um, incursions? In other words, is this prompting um, a reaction, a, a sortie from the Taiwan side that, you know, will grind them down over time. This is a, you know, probably a significant increase in, in op tempo, right? Yeah. And, and I was in Taiwan in 2018 and 2019. And I think it was in 2019, Admiral uh, Blair had written an op-ed uh, advising Taiwan and Japan that they're going to have to change their policy because they can't have their the official policy from Taiwan was that you have to respond to every incursion. You have to react. And Admiral Blair's advice was, well, you're not going to be able to sustain that with the with your air force. You're going to run your air force into the ground if you do that. And so I'm not sure where Taiwan's reactions are right now. I think they still it's their official policy that they have to respond. Uh, but it's becoming it's becoming problematic, which is why the sale of these uh, and getting these F-16s uh, into Taiwan is, you know, really needed. Even then, even with the 60 or so F-16s that were, you know, authorized to be sold to them, they're still going to be in a serious, uh, you know, catch up because the Chinese just have a bigger air force and they're just going to try to run them into the ground. Uh, but the center line crossings, I think, are the ones that are really, and you can see a lot down here in the in the southwest of China around Pratis Island. It's where most predominantly most of the incursions occur, but you'll see that a lot did occur in the middle of this Taiwan Strait in the, in the northern area. So the Chinese are probing everywhere, and I think it's uh, it's just it just really it's becoming harder and harder for Taiwan to defend themselves alone with just a reaction force or a, a response package that says I have to respond to every one. This is a picture from last August. I just put this in because it always just uh, amazes me to see, uh, you know, a Chinese PLA Navy warship observing a Taiwan uh, frigate there, a Knox class frigate or a Perry class frigate that we had sold to them. But clearly they're not more than much more than 12 miles off the east coast of Taiwan right there. And this is another way that since last August that things have really changed and the status has changed. This It's a new normal and so when I were seeing things like this, where you see uh, this is the Shandong here in April, uh, April 5th, as it leaves, uh, it comes through the Bashi Channel. This is Japanese reporting, but it, it comes through the Bashi Channel. And then as we talked or you, people have read about the second phase of this uh, training or, or these major exercises that they did one in August, the Joint Fire Strike. And then what we think, what I think we saw in, uh, in April here with this is called uh, uh, joint sword. This is the ex Chinese labeled their exercise joint sword. And essentially for several days, they surrounded Taiwan again, they ramped it up. And they actually had the Shandong operating just east of where those uh, I'll just kind of in this area here where I'm circling, the Shandong was operating there and doing flight operations and having J-15s fly uh, on the east side of Taiwan real close. So you get this really uh, major air uh, evolution for this exercise. And so I think this is, could be characterized as the joint anti-air raid campaign. Now there was a, a simulation. If you looked at some of the Chinese press, they had a lot of videos out talking about missile strikes coming in. 
there were no missile strikes that we know of in this exercise in terms of ballistic missiles like we saw last August. So a lot of aircraft, much more aircraft, hundreds of aircraft, a couple hundred aircraft in this uh, short period exercise uh, that were up uh, around Taiwan. And so that's why I think this is really, uh, they probably had simulation in a command post of missile firing, and then they had the live uh, flights with the PLA Air Force and PLA Naval Air Force. And they even included um, here uh, most recently in May, we've had uh, the island of Taiwan being flown around and circumnavigated by unmanned aerial vehicles from the, the Chinese uh, Air Force and Naval Air Forces. The BCK-005 is, uh, uh, works with the PLA Naval Air Force. And you can see their tracks here as they were circumnavigating and flying and kind of doing reconnaissance uh, operations here on the east coast of Taiwan. So if you've got a carrier theoretically out here uh, and your carrier's operating and the carrier needs to get targeting data for the east coast to strike Suau or Walian or whatever, uh, these you know UAVs are going to be able to provide that long-term dwell. So it's clear that Chinese have gone to school on our, our tactics in terms of having uh, ISR up and be able to provide that uh, to their forces that it would be targeting the east coast of Taiwan. And then just here, this is just, uh, it started the end of uh, April, but through May, uh, you'll see Chinese warships again. I think there's a three ship SAG led by a Renhai class cruiser, uh, went through the uh, Tsushima Strait, uh, through the, the La Perouse, and then and down the east coast of Honshu, and then around Iwo, Iwo Jima. While this was all happening, you have Japanese Prime Minister Kishida going to Korea. You have Japanese putting in PAC-3s down in the lower Yukus. Uh, you have the Reagan out right about now that's going to be doing sea trials down at Iwato. So you have a lot of things going on. And what I what I like to tell people is, you know, we, we talk about this increased uh, operations to surround Taiwan that we've noticed over the last three years really increasing. And now we're starting to see the Chinese expand another circle around the Japanese. Uh, they couldn't do that uh, 10, 15, 20 years ago because they didn't have the, the Navy. They didn't have the platforms. Now they have the ability to do kind of both. They can pressurize Taiwan on a daily basis and then also extend operations around uh, Japan. Now, this is not to say that they could go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Japanese in a naval conflict uh, in the Sea of Japan necessarily, uh, but it's an indicator of where the Chinese are thinking and where they want to go. And as they continue to grow their Navy, it's just going to get greater and greater. So I think this is my last slide talking about the, you know, I've used it last time, this decade of concern, where we know that the Chinese military had been ordered as early as 2020 to have the capability to take Taiwan. And that we think that, you know, the latest that they could use military force to take Taiwan would be around 2030, 2035. And then they'd want everybody to come to Beijing in 2049 to have this big grand ceremony to celebrate the great rejuvenation. I had been for the last 10 years, given this slide, I gave it when I was still in uniform and I was pretty sure it would be much later in the decade, 2030. Uh, over the last, uh, I'd say 12, 20 months, uh, I'm really worried like some of these other leaders that have spoken out here in the last two years, that this uh, PLA may be thinking that they can make a move here by mid by mid decade, 2025, something before uh, our presidential election uh, or around our presidential election, but before that inauguration. There's going to be a an election for president in Taiwan in January of 2024, and then our election in the fall. And given the the weather patterns and the the the, the time of year it's very likely that in the fall of 2024, we could see something. I don't like to be uh, an alarmist. Maybe, maybe I am in some sense, uh, people that watch me and see me speak. But it just seems to me that with the statements from Admiral Davidson and the CNO, um, uh, from Admiral uh, Aquilino, from Admiral Papro, from Admiral Richards, uh, from this uh, General Minahan, uh, it just seems to be... And, and the concerns expressed in Japan and their uh, efforts to increase their defense spending, uh, it just seems that there's a lot of evidence to suggest that China is at least militarily thinking that they can do this. And I think that should concern us all.
and I'll stop there and look for questions. Jim, that was great. What a, 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 a fully encompassing brief on what's happening with the PLA, and particularly the Navy, the Navy buildup that continues. Uh, I, I just we, we just have time really for one question. It, it's I, I share your concern, at, at least a, you know much of your concern. One of the things that that grabbed my attention, you know, in the past six months was the news that in terms of its demographics, China is now uh, starting to shrink, right? So it's it's one child policy, uh, which it had reversed some years ago in this uh, the, the past decade, it, 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 it rejected the one child policy. So Chinese can now have more than one child, but you know, the decades that they had that policy in effect uh, and the modernization, you know, it's, it's true around the world that when uh, women, have fewer children, and when they get educated, and when they have uh, you know places in the job market, they choose to have uh, fewer fewer children. And when they urbanize, uh, families choose to have fewer children. So that's a demographic trend that they probably can't reverse. Uh, so you see now the Chinese China's population is starting to ebb, um, and I to me that would portend a serious a, a sense of serious concern if I were Xi Jinping, that my power is starting to peak if it hasn't already peaked. And so is that, does that portend in your mind, does that portend action sooner rather than being able to continue to be patient as China had been, you know, during the period of Deng Xiaoping and Xi Jinping and, you know, before, not Xi Jinping, but uh, Hu Jintao, et cetera. Now we get to a period where you know, perhaps there isn't the opportunity to be patient anymore. Yeah, I think that's exactly a, a factor that, that we don't know exactly how they'll respond to that because we know that the one child policy that was for over 30 years uh, created, as they call these little princes, this little idea that every family had one child and that child was so precious to them that they wouldn't want to risk their lives. Um, so that some people look at it that way and say, because of this, it's it may be a, a deterrent to take action because there's less people that would be willing to sacrifice and lay down their life for their country. On the other hand, as you explained, uh, the, the party itself could look at this and say, hey, if we don't move now, we may not have the ability to muster the forces that we have today and that are growing. Uh, I didn't mention, but the Chinese here for their uh, naval anniversary I think it was the 74th, they came out and they put out a, a video here, about an hour long video. Um, I'm going to get mess up the title. Uh, uh, it, uh, Blue Sea, basically, that they're going to see, they're going to be out there. And they had a lot of uh, stuff about their carrier aviation program. And then there was a number of articles that came out that talking about how they're really ramping up PLA Navy uh, carriers, uh, pilots and air crew. And so they're it seems like they've got a big pool at 1.2 or 1.4 billion people. There's been some new estimates saying that their actual census numbers were off and they're actually smaller than they've been telling people. But regardless of the actual numbers, it's a, it's a lot of people that they can draw into uh, and people that are in poor rural areas, if they can get them, you know, out of that to, to serve, we're seeing that reflected. So I think that's an, th those demographic issues can cut both ways, but my read on it is, this would be another reason why the party would say, we need to go now. Another one is food security. We're seeing a lot of talk about food security in China over the last six months. And, and Xi's on a big swing checking up on food security. And they've just established a new food security uh, police element, if you will. So there's aging, uh, ageism, you know, people are getting older, the one child policy, food security, energy access, there are a lot of things that are coming to be crisis. And so le the legitimacy of the party rests upon being able to bring those services and goods and prosperity to the people of China. But it also rests upon this idea that they're, they want to be whole and respected from this abuse of the century of humiliation that they feel that they've suffered from the hands of the West and, and Japan. And so it seems like it's coming to a culmination point and, this, this time period uh, in the next, I'd say, 12 uh, to 24 months is going to be very critical. 
Um, I want to ask one real, one other real quick question because you talked about shipbuilding and the growth of the strategic rocket forces and um, uh, you know all the different classes of ships, including aircraft carriers, etc. There was one point on one of your slides that just was about um, unmanned aerial vehicles. You know, as, as part of that encircling the ISR around even east of Taiwan. Where, what are the Chinese doing in terms of um, unmanned surface and unmanned underwater vehicles? Is that, is that a major push for the PLA modernization or is it, or, or are they lagging behind perhaps the West and the United States? I think they're, they're clearly, they're working on it. They, they tell us they're working on it. We see uh, platforms at like Zhuhai and other places where they have unmanned surface vehicles and we know about their, their, talk over the last five years about an undersea wall and uh, UUVs and things of that nature. Where are they in terms of being able to keep pace with us? I think they're behind when it comes to large diameter UUVs, uh, given the work that we've been doing on that. But like everything that, that we, almost everything, but a lot of what I showed you in those slides and other slides we showed last year, a lot of stuff comes from us. They, they are able to leapfrog because they're stealing our technology. And so platforms that you saw on that screen today are, are basically stolen from the United States. And so, for instance, emails. How did they get emails so fast? How, did, how is that possible when we haven't even fielded one and they've got one in the water now? So I worry, I worry about uh, things like un, unmanned vehicles and where their research and development is. And I just saw an, an email or a, a note just before I walked in uh, some professor at, uh, that, that taught for 20 years at some U.S. Pr uh, university, Chinese professor, but taught in America for over 20 years, has now just announced he's re you know, leaving this American university to go to China to work on hypersonics in China. So that's another area that we could talk about is you know, the number of uh, uh, people who have been studying here and learning and taking that technology back and providing it to the PLA. Yeah, definitely a, an area of concern. Well, Jim, sadly, we're out of time. This was a great conversation. Thank you for the in-depth update. Um, you know, last year, I think the video that we did with you on, on our YouTube channel uh, was seen by, we're getting close to 280,000 views. Uh, I pre predict that this one will also be, uh, be well subscribed. So I thank you for your time and for the details. And um, for our guests, uh, for our listeners, uh, my guest has been uh, retired Navy Captain Jim Fennell, expert on the PLA Navy, uh, former director of intelligence for the U.S. Pacific Fleet. And he was uh, joining us today from his home in Switzerland. Jim, thanks again. Thanks, Bill. All the best. Well, that wraps up another episode of the Proceedings Podcast brought to you by the members of the Naval Institute. If you like us, ring the bell, subscribe to the show, tell your, your family and friends and become a member of the Naval Institute at usni.org forward slash join. And until next week, remember, victory begins at the Naval Institute.